Um, hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Bienvenidos. Um, please get yourself some food at the back. Get some, some cold water. Um, make yourself comfortable. If you've never been to the space before, this is Galeria Eva. If you need the restroom, it'll be right around the corner. Um, right around that corner back there. Um, my name is Marisol Cortez. My pronouns are she and they. And um, along with Greg, who's doing the live streaming down there, we are co-editors of Deceleration. Um, please feel free, we're, since we are live streaming online, if you know of people that wanted to attend but uh, couldn't be here in person, please feel free to take your phones out and, and just send the, the link to the live stream. Um, it's on uh, at Facebook, it's facebook.com slash deceleration. On Twitter, our handle is mydeceleration. So I think it's also That's streaming right. from Twitter too. Um, deceleration, if you haven't heard of us, we're a, a grassroots media project. We try to create a commons um, for thought and praxis, uh, specifically around environmental justice in South Texas. And part of like, what we try to do differently is, is that we're not just news, we're not just reporting, not just media, but we try to also be, we root that work in community. Um, we root that work in, in social movement. And so we're really trying to have community-based analysis that can inform the, the work, the work that we all do, right? Um, and, and how we live, ultimately. So this is really kind of our first um, like big conversation like that. And so it's, it's really exciting to have y'all here. It's exciting to have Arturo here. Um, I wear another hat, which is that I, I also teach right now in the English department at UTSA, which has um, been able to bring Arturo, uh, Dr. Arturo Escobar here to San Antonio. Um, it's probably not a stretch for me to say he's like, can I say world renowned? <laughs> like <Yeah>. he's <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you, but he's a very, very well-respected, like global, globally, like thinker and writer and activist from Colombia, um, who writes about um, decolonial movements, um, and I think has a lot of resonance. What he writes and thinks about has a lot of res resonance for what we do here, and he's so he's here as UTSA's 2023 Brackenridge Distinguished Scholar. So uh, much thanks to UTSA. Um, but because of what he writes about and what be because of what he does, right, because he, his, his research is really grounded in movement, in social movements, we knew that we didn't want his visit here um, just to be limited to the university. Um, we knew that his work has deep relevance for all of us here who work in community for a variety of intersecting issues, right? Climate justice, land back, protection of the sacred, abolition, decolonization of our relationships to each other, um, which depends on our decolonization of our relationships to the, to the earth. Um, so we, we wanna thank also Fundacion Semproc, which uh, has helped to support this particular gathering in the community. Um, to have this conversation beyond just the university, right? And of course, much thanks to Galeria Eva, um, to Vero and to Rosie um, for opening your beautiful space for, for this conversation. Um, so from all of us, we welcome you, um, Dr. Escobar, to, to Galeria, to the South Side, um, and to the land um, whose original name as shared with me by the tribal chair of the Estorpina is Yaganawena meaning place where I rest. And um, similarly, the Tapilam Kohitekan Nation knows this place as Yanawana, which means land of spirit waters. Um, so in just a minute, we'll, we'll have a kind of formal welcome by uh, Carla Sainz. Um, but first, I'll just share a little bit for a couple minutes about how this gathering came together and why it's so important um, to have you here with us. And some of this I've already shared, you know, with you when we did our interview. But um, but for the rest of you, um, I got my start thinking about all the issues that we work on uh, in relationship to water. About 20, uh, gosh, more than 20 years ago now, <laughs> um, 
there was a struggle known as PGA, the Professional Golf Association, which was uh, a big luxury resort thing that they wanted to build over the recharge zone of the Edwards Aquifer. Um, and it really, more deeper than that, it was really a struggle against a uh, very racist, patriarchal, um, and extractive history of economic development that sent all of the growth, most of the growth, to the north, to the north side, over the most sensitive part of the aquifer uh, that we all depend on, right? Um, by disinvesting from the city's poor and working class brown and black neighborhoods. Um, that struggle is where I met a lot of you um, and where I heard people say, el agua es vida, uh, for the first time, right? Water is life. In the years after PGA, I learned from indigenous solidarity work that the local dynamics that we were, we were fighting here are actually an outgrowth of a much longer um, continental and global history of, of settler colonialism, of plantation colonialism, of genocide um, and enslavement, right? Um, and so when I came back here, when I came back home to San Antonio to try to figure out how to use my education, how to use my writing, to use my research to further land protection struggles here, a lot of what I ended up writing about was the colonial nature of, of gentrification and, uh, and, and about displacement as, as an urban land struggle. Um, and the deep connections between our call for the right to the city and indigenous concepts of the rights of nature, los derechos de la madre tierra uh, and, and buen vivir, um, or sumac cause. So it was in those struggles that I came across Dr. Escobar's work. So it wasn't when, it wasn't in school, it wasn't in my academic work. It was in my community work with all of you. Um, but when I did read his work on development and on alternatives to development, I saw our own work reflected there um, in struggles for environmental justice, housing justice, racial justice, gen you know, all of the things that we work on. And it, it gave language to what I felt like we had been actually doing for a long time, even if we weren't necessarily thinking about it in those terms. So to have him here to share some of our work and ideas, and then have him share his work and ideas in return is really profound for me. Um, and I hope this can be the beginning of a longer conversation in the community about how we put these ideas into practice here in this place and ultimately about how do we live? How do we live now amid multiple crises? How do we exit from terracide, which is a concept to explain? How do we shift into another mode of thinking and being and doing? So before we get to that exchange, um, Carla, Carla Sainz um, has offered to open our dialogue with a welcome. She is a visual interpreter whose work bridges three dimensions nature, mind, and humanity. She's a public artist whose work is deeply engaged with themes of biomimicry. So learning, right, from our more than human relatives, um, and right now focusing, I think, on solitary bees. Um, originally from the EPE, she's worked closely with Sotzi communities in um, Sina Cantan, Chiapas, Mexico. So Carla, whenever you feel ready. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. Thank you. Um, let, let me see if you can, can you, can you listen back there, Pero? Or do I need the microphone? Yeah. I don't need the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, do yeah. I need the microphone? I need the microphone. <laughs> okay. Anyway. It's just, um, I never know if to put it too close or too far. <laughs> Hi, Frankie. <laughs> um, well, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'm very excited, very honored, uh, because when, when community get together, um, a lot of things happen. And sometimes what happens with community get together is not uh, so uh, tangible, but it's very profound. 
So that's why I'm very honored and very grateful to, to have the opportunity to, to open the space for the conversation and um, to call for a, for a blessing um, of Jana Wana. Um, today, um, I, I was thinking what, how to open a space and I just, I just went down the river and um, I took my daughter with me, so I went down to the river and then I was rushing, I was driving, very aggressive drivers and I was just like, ah, oh, we need to get here. And I was like, I'm hungry, I don't wanna be here. And as soon as we get, got close to the water, everything changed. Everything changed when we were close to the river. And we sat there and, and we, I, said, I said, mommy, what, well, what are we doing here? And I said, just doesn't matter, just listen. Let's, let's say hello to Janawana, let's sit here and listen what she has to tell us. And we sat there and immediately we felt peace. We felt uh, present, we felt so, uh, she said, I said, how you feel? And she said, happy, joyful. And everything changed everything because we were there connecting with Jana Wana. And I, um, I wanted to share that with our guest, with, our, with Arturo, because this land is, is the river. The, I, I feel that and I see how, how the river is, está en las venas, en las venas de los ancestros de esta tierra. And is in our, I don't know how to say in English, but but está en nuestras venas, está en las venas eh, de, de, de los ancestros de esta tierra. And that's why, that's why the river is sacred. But also it's sacred, and it can be sacred for you too. So I, I brought these, these stones for, for our guests, but you, you're also welcome at the end to, to look at the stone. Um, so if, if you would like to take a stone, I... I um, uh, the Janawana offer uh, when we ask, and we found these these stones. And um, so, if if the guest would like to take a stone um, to receive the blessing from Janawana, uh, please just uh, choose choose a stone. And then um, after the the space is open, um, I, uh, I I will like to invite you to put the stones back, and then the person that is is talking. Sorry, I'm giving my back. <laughs> um, just take a stone and and talk. And talk with with that um, that just just feeling that that Janawana is is there. Um, can anyone hold the microphone for me? Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, so to open the space, um, I think it's important that, that we acknowledge the diversity here, that in any ecosystem, because when we were down, down the river, uh, so, sorry, Greg, I just, pro probably I just need to just, I tell you when to go. When, we when we were down the river, there, um, there was the, the fire, the, the libélulas, libélulas, yeah. dragonflies. The dragonflies, red ones, blue ones, and then the dogs came, and and that that ecosystem that is just just there in the middle of the city is the heart, is Janawana, and that diversity is also our community. We all have something unique to contribute to our community, and and to open this space is important that that we acknowledge the 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 importance that every element of the ecosystem has. So to open the space, um, I want to invite you to, to be present because that's what the river gave me today, the gift to be present. The gift to be present and then when I was driving here in the traffic, the only thing I felt was the sun in my solar plexus and I felt just that energy filling up every bone, every hair, everything in me. And I just wanted to share that energy that, that I just collect from the sun 
And then when I was driving, I turned into the street and the, the name of the street was Sun. I was like, oh yeah, this is just all connected. We are all connected. So to be present, um, please, we're gonna just do a moment of, of being in silence for just a moment and listen. Listen to your heart, listen to, to your, your breath. Just breathe and be present with yourselves. Please close your eyes, close your eyes, give yourself that, that gift to be present and listen, everything around you. Nature is everywhere, we are nature. Give yourself the gift to be present. present and thank you so much for being here sharing your knowledge um, thank you okay thank you Carla so much um, so I'm going to introduce each person and then if you want to take maybe you know eight ten minutes to, to share your work tell us about your work and, and and I think more importantly the ideas that inform what you do, right? Um, especially the work that you do around uh, you know extraction, decolonization, land struggle, abolition, earth protection. Um, so we'll go in alphabetical order by your first name and hello, and um, and I'll, I'll read a little intro um, as well just to open. So Diana. Um, Yana Lopez, she, her, ella, is a Chicana who was raised in between San Antonio, Texas and Rio Bravo, Tamaulipas, Mexico. And her work with Centro por la Justicia, known as Southwest Workers Union, involves linking issues around environmental justice, living wage, and accountable governance. And she's currently in her seventh year as the executive director of Southwest Workers Union where she's facilitating the birth of the Regional Healing and Resilience Hub Project. And she's also a mother of two wild wolves and loves to read, is a sticker fanatic, and has a deep appreciation for flowers. Does this work? Yeah. All right. Buenas tardes, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for welcoming this, welcoming uh, me in this space and and this work. Um, so some of us know us as Centro, and some of us know us as Southwest Workers Union. Our government name is generally Centro por la Justicia, um, but our community name tends to be SWU or Southwest Workers Union. And so I. I got involved um, a very long time ago doing health studies in my neighborhood. And so I grew up um, at the end of the runway uh, from uh, on the south side of town between Kelly Air Force Base and or the former Kelly Air Force Base. Um, and that is um, how I grew up. I grew up with airplanes um, flying over my home. I grew up near um, Le Leon Creek. And at a certain point in my childhood, we couldn't swim in the creek anymore. I didn't know why until I needed a summer job. And I started doing work with Southwest Workers Union. And I never left, right? 16 years later, um, I'm still there. 
But one of the challenges that we faced was while the military base closed in 2001 and we were actually able to get the extent of what was underground, um, we started facing other issues. So the base transformed into one of the largest inland ports. Literally, the logo is planes, trains, and trucks, right? And so we started seeing an influx of, of a different form of contamination, right, in, from what we envisioned. Um, and, and part of that, that work is like, while we were able to shut down and transition, we were facing a whole new different problem, right? Um, and we started facing issues around um, energy, right? It was a it was a fracking site. It it brings in um, um, materials that are then um, uh, trucked out to different um, sites in South Texas, right? And so, what what our, our work was transforming in a different way. We had to kind of shift the way that we organized. Right, and, and it wasn't just one issue, right? It, it kind of stemmed, I was thinking about this this morning, um, and it kind of just stemmed into these different smaller issues, right? We, we, we couldn't address the, the train and natural gas issues without having to address the investments of the public utility in natural gas, right? And so it just kind of leads us into these different webs where it's like, where does it actually stop? Right. Once we start exposing the reality of, of, of the domino effect of contamination and, and the web and the um, investments in all these dirty practices that affect our community, we become really overwhelmed by all of it. Right. Um, and so part of part of our work was was, well, what is the solution? Right. What what do we work on? How do we maintain ourselves and not burn out trying to address all these different things? And so my organization, um, we are historically a labor union. Um, we started doing work around contamination because the school workers that were part of our union lived near Kelly Air Force Base, right? And so while we didn't stop um, engaging with the workers, um, um, in that in that sector, we were starting to engage with them like on a different level of, of pieces, right? So while we were addressing um, public utility campaigns and e energy justice campaigns, the root of the cause was the same. The same people were still affected by a multitude of issues, um, and and our definition of environmental justice is the cumulative effects of these multiple sources of contamination. Um, that have led to, to where we're at now. The area I'm talking about is, is um, District 4 on the south side. Um, and um, that's kind of led to our work around being visionary is, is we were faced with, with these, um, and time, time check me, that's why I'm, I'm looking, because uh, I could talk about this for a really long time. Um, is, is at a certain point, um, we have to really start looking at, at the multitude of solutions and working towards building the vision that we want to see, which is where, where Marisol mentioned the birth of, of uh, the Regional Healing and Resiliency Hub is, is the reality that many organizations and a lot of people on this, on this panel already hold spaces for our community to come together um, and be safe and be centered and have their, th their necessities. The pandemic um, kind of exposed the reality of our networks um, and, the, and, and the true cost of like, what does it take for us to hold our community in that way? Um, and how is it very different than uh, policy bodies, um, elected officials, how they hold um, what, what is called like an emergency response, right? When a pandemic happens, we, we face this a lot. When, when winter storm, storm Uri happened, right? Who were the people who were on the ground one to two days later? It was us. <laughs> it was folks here at Galeria Eva, you know, providing meals, gathering folks, people at SWU, people at, at Yanawana Herbolarios, um, kind of moving stuff. Uh, Greg was, Greg and Marisol were like pu putting stuff out. Black Freedom Factory was putting stuff out around what, what to do, where to go, where are cooling centers, or so, sorry, not cooling centers. Yeah. That's, that's another <laughs> issue. Um, where are warming centers, things like that, right? But, but it, it exposed the reality of our like existing organic nature that brings us together. Um, and the understanding that 
that while we all have faced these different issues, we still think and we still work towards something different. Um, and, and while um, part of it is stopping sort of these bad structures, um, the other part of it is what are we going to replace it with, right? That, that gray area in, in just transition is like, this is the bad stuff. We know we don't want that stuff, but this is our vision over here. And so we have a long way to go um, between here and here. And what many of these of, of, of us are working on is sort of unraveling this like yarn ball of, of, that, of that vision, right? And there's not one end and one beginning. There are hundreds of ends and hundreds of beginnings because everybody has a different strategy to reach this larger goal, right? And we're and we're looking at you know things like basic you know drinking water, uh, clean air, living, um, all these different basic needs that that before we talk about community uh, beautification of of our of our communities we're talking about access to clean safe drinking water and even a place to live right and so that's that's kind of where our work starts in a bit is is getting to that place of like just having these basic needs that have been stripped away and are continuing to be stripped away while still holding our community at the center and then on a larger scale envisioning something different right like something that's not what we're facing now um, and I think that's that's where my that's where I love to talk about is like this experience of like yes we shut down something we we could successfully shut down spruce coal plant yay but now the biggest issue is that it's also going to be moved into a natural gas plant so while we pushed forward and we increased you know renewables in the past decade we're still facing with these really big issues that it kind of makes it a little bit hard to to even just say that's that's a victory that's a yay you know when we still have a lot of things to face right and so part of our work as organizers and part of my work um, in creating spaces I love bringing people together because a lot of magic happens when you bring people together there's folks in this in this space that I haven't seen in like three to four years right that they didn't even know I have children. <laughs> and so part, part of that reality is like we have to come together on a more uh, personal level. It's about relationship building. It's about sharing spaces and sharing safe spaces and being able to say, you know, funding, money, policy, it plays a role in our organizations. But more, but more importantly, it's about the cultural um, connections that we all bring to the space and how how yes we disagree on things we will continue to disagree on things this is not a utopia um, but it's about how we work together and communicate to make sure that 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 when, when we need to come together we come together and I could give Frankie Frankie a call and Frankie gives me a call and be like hey this is coming up can we do this yes see you next week Right, and that's that's what really gets things moving, and that's what movement building really like flourishes is when we're able to have these conversations and these relationships and mutual understanding that what we're addressing different issues and different work, um, what is coming together is that we all have a respect for the different strategies that we're taking, um, and that understanding that we're moving towards something. Um, that's different than the reality that we're facing now. And so my organization currently um, works um, through a, a membership-based organization. We run mutual aid programs, um, but they're really tied to our historical work. So we have a community garden and we fought for access to fresh food. Um, and now we, we, we run a fresh food mutual aid program because we know that people at the base uh, of of their day need something good to eat. We're talking about the staples, papas, tomates, uh, chiles, jalapenos, um, these different things that really don't matter, trespass it, different cultures, ages, generations. Um, our folks are able to come and get the, those fresh foods because that isn't available um, near near their home right and so they come and they get the information that they need to get and you know hang out in our right now we have a temporary garden because we don't have an office yet um but they're they're able to kind of still create that community and safe space and so 
that's part of our work right now. We are doing a lot of work around utility justice, um, really fighting against uh, CPS energy in terms of sort of um, increasing renewables, making sure that there's a fair rate structure um, and um, an understanding of um, really being able to have a public input within that process as a public utility. And so that's just a little bit of our work that, that we hold and now and I'll close it on up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dilo. Um, yeah, it's crazy to me, like, yeah, I met you however many years ago? I met like, I think you were 12 like, years ago. Yeah, you were like 20 or something. Like, you were just a little baby. <laughs> um, and it's really been amazing, like, to see SWU, like, develop and up. Like, move away from, like, no, 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 to, like, yeah, what do we actually want? Right. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so next, Frankie, um, Frankie Orona. He is uh, Tongva and Chumash from California, Borado from Texas, a husband of 22 years, a father, an entrepreneur, and an activist. He is the co-founder and executive director of Society of Native Nations, which is an intertribal Native American nonprofit based in Texas and California. He's also a member of the American Indian Movement and the environmental liaison for his tribal chief, Anthony Morales, of the Gabrieleno Tongva tribe of the San Gabriel Band of Mission Indians. He sits on many coalition steering committees, um, nonprofit environmental organization boards, and is also part of the UN INC EJ Plastics Treaty delegation. Frankie lives with his wife, um, who's I saw her. Uh, Yay, Maida, uh, who's back there, and and their children here in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, haku haku. Uh, First and foremost, I want to thank the, the spirits and the people of the land uh, for allowing us to come here in a good way and, uh, and be able to share in this way and all the beautiful people that have gathered to share their life experiences um, and the wisdom they've been able to accumulate uh, through those life experiences. Um, I started getting this, getting involved in this work, um, credit all to, to our elders um, you know, in protecting the water and the sovereignty of our people. And um, I, you know, Uncle Robert John and Jimmy Blue Eyes and Grandma Gloria and uh, Grandma Morningstar and Lillian Robles and Rebecca and Rhonda Robles, all these beautiful elders that uh, embraced me, you know, took me and uh, helped push me in the right directions and, and trying to do good things for our community and be involved in ceremony and understanding how that's intertwined uh, with, the, with, with the work that we do on protecting the sacred sites and um, what I realized through their teachings, you know, Uncle once said, uh, Uncle Robert John said, you know, we have all these problems that we're working on and that we're, that we're dealing with today. And he said, you know, what did you think was going to happen when we started sucking death out of the ground? And, uh, and I started thinking about that, and it was, it was pretty, pretty intense when he said it, and talking about fossil fuels and what have you. And... Um, understanding the connectedness in that right and saying that we've forgotten our responsibilities as people um, on what we have uh, with the environment that we coexist with he says you know the natural laws of life and we're taught these and we take on that that natural law of life when we're brought into this physical world from the spirit world uh, we, we, we sign that contract and he says you know what is the first thing you do when you come into the physical world uh, from the spirit world you know, you're a baby, and the first thing you do is cry. And what is crying? Crying is breathing. So you breathe in, you breathe out. You breathe in, you breathe out. So you take, and you give back. And you take, and you give back. And then all that we coexist with takes what we give, and then gives back within what we take. And we've forgotten to give back as much as we've taken. And uh, understanding that relationship, knowing that we have to, uh, in order to have a healthy, sustainable future for our children to look forward to, not dread, right? We all want our children to not just survive, but thrive. And so uh, understanding that, he says, you know, the way that we uh, work on these issues and how we deal with these issues, how we fix these, these issues is with love. If you love your air, you want, it to, you want to nurture it. If you love your water, you want, it, you want to nurture it. If you love these lands and the environment you coexist with, you want to nurture it. And so it's, you know, I always tell, tell everybody when I go to many of these conferences uh, that are about environmentalism, you know, first, you know, we, we can't be putting 
each other down or attacking each other. I always say, let's treat these environmental conferences like AA groups. My name is Frankie Arona, and I help to perpetuate this system that we're fighting because I, I took an Uber or I flew a plane or I, I drove a car. But now that we've acknowledged that, we can embrace it. And what is that healing process from there, right? How do we make the smaller footprint? How do we start making some transitions, you know, internally within our own families, but how do we start holding that 1% uh, that dictates what our society becomes dependent on, right? Those 1%, those corporations that put out these policies, these laws. And that's why when we talk about historical trauma, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't like that word historical trauma. I just say it's trauma because it, 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 it implies that it's in our, in our history. It's, it's in our past tense, and it's not. It's just trauma. It just looks different, different tactics, different approaches, whether it be policies, laws, whatever it may be. It's just, it's, it's continued uh, abuse. It's continued uh, racism, colonial mindset uh, tactics uh, against uh, the people that are trying to remember how it is to say we and us rather than I and me, right? We want that American dream, you know, get mine. And so, you know, trying to, trying to change that. I always tell people when we talk about decolonization, let's talk about decolonizing, decolonizing our minds, the way we think about things, the way we approach things uh, and see things and, and, you know, how we interact with each other, remembering that we are related. And we're related in more ways than, than, than we're not, you know, through the air that we breathe, the land that we touch, the water that we drink, which is all the same that our ancestors once did and used in their lives to sustain themselves. And it's gonna be what our children and our children's children are gonna be uh, using to, to sustain their lives. So remembering those old tradi tra traditional teachings, values, and morals are very, very important. And that's what I've learned from our elders in doing this work. And that's why I always say, when we're talking about environmentalism or activism, it's part of our culture as na Native peoples, you know, because we're taught by our elders to leave a place better than the way that we found it. It's natural to be, you know, to, to, to think that way, think about our communities and our people and how do we how do we implement that in our everyday lives when we live in a society that teaches you how to just think of yourself, right? How to get your own. And, and it's very complicated because, you know, culturally in the different, you know, uh, communities, um, the dynamics are very, very hard. What works one for one community doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work for another community. And so, you know, working on protecting the water you know, like these, these false solutions that they're putting out, like desalination, that's just commodifying our water so that corporations can decide and dictate who gets clean water access and who doesn't um, is wrong. And it's a system that fails because it produces more toxic brine and, 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 uh, and um, chemicals than it does actual usable, feasible water. And it's still extraction. You're taking water out of the ocean and you're killing the marine by putting by putting that, that brine, that toxic waste and chemicals back into the ocean, you're killing the ocean life, you're killing the marine life, you're killing the microorganisms that we coexist with, and, and it's wrong. Just like carbon capture, it's selling you air. Carbon capture is saying, you know, look, you wanna live in this community where there's fresh, fresher air, then it's gonna cost you $2 million. But if you wanna live over there for 200,000, your air quality is not gonna be as good. You have to pay attention to what the corporations are doing because they're trying to co-opt our movement and, our, and the, and the, and the language we use when we're trying to protect the very thing that is natural and should not be commodified. And so it was natural to be involved in, in those things. And, and, and it first started off for me with, with the grandmas and aunties of my community um, taking me and in, 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 in bringing me with them uh, to protect these sacred sites and fight for the water. And later it was you know, our, my uncles in my life that, and the elders that you know, said, you know, we need to talk about this on a, on a more mass level, right? On a, on a global level, you know, how do we protect this water? Uh, because there was elders that would come down from many different places and I've been blessed and honored and I'm honored to have been, done ceremony and spend time with elders from multiple communities um, throughout this world. And, and, it, and there was prophecies that were said that, you know, the next world war would be over clean drinking water and that there would be a day, and this is in the year 2000, there would be a day that we'd be paying more for a gallon of water than a gallon of gas. Well, 15 years later, it came true in many communities. So I, for me, I think of my children, I think about you know how I don't want them to be having to pay 30 or $40 for a gallon of water in the future, or you know relying or depending on corporations to decide whether or not they get you know clean access to water. It shouldn't be commodified. And so fighting for those natural resources, knowing that they have the rights, they have rights, uh, to coexist and have a healthy, sustainable future. And, and realizing, like my brother Juan said one time, says, 
we need to be reminded that we are the water, we are the land, we are the air, the environment and ourselves, we are the same. We are, without a healthy environment, we can't have a healthy future. We won't have uh, you know, a, a sustainable future for our children if we don't start making the changes that are necessary uh, today. And that's why I always tell youth, you know, if, if you don't feel that we're taking care of business now, if you don't think that we're, we're doing what we're supposed to do or not do today, then hold us accountable. Hold us accountable because we need to, to start thinking about what we leave behind. And so, yeah, a lot of the work that we do is, is local. We're, we're, we're working a lot on the issues related from the premium basin, from the extraction, all the way out to the Gulf and to, to exports and the, the petrochemical industries now doubling, tripling down on production and manufacturing, uh, especially because of the pandemic and what it in, in, in heightened when it comes to plastics production. And, and it's a huge threat. The, the plastics, the petrochemical industry is a massive threat. Most people don't know that 99% of plastics comes from fossil fuels. It's a cracking process. And one of the largest cra cracking, cracker plants that exists is in the Gulf. It's in Corpus, Corpus Christi, where the city has already determined last year that 75% of their, of their water is gonna go to industry, not to residents or not to human consumption, to industry. And the desalination plant that they're proposing is going to go 100 percent to industry. So you can only imagine what their projection is for for more manufacturing build out and and infrastructure build out along the Gulf here in Texas. And with the iron bill that was pushed out, that was supposed to do all this good, it sacrificed the Gulf. It sacrificed Texas, Louisiana, the Appalachians, and Alaska. Environmental justice does not mean sacrifice a few for the many. That is not environmental justice. And we need to make sure that we're aware of those things and know that you know, the industry is turning more of our communities into sacrifice zones. You know, and, and, and in places where the national average is three to four times higher when it comes to cancer or you know, chronic lung diseases and respiratory issues. And those things are important because people are trying to stay in their communities and live in their communities where they're losing you know, five to 15 years of their lifespan for just wanting to stay where they grow where they grew up. That's wrong, there needs to be accountability, there needs to be uh, equity in how, all, this, how all, this, all the decisions are being made um, when it comes to where these infrastructures are being built. And we need to say we need a transition, not just transition away from just single use plastics or you know, the fossil fuel, but what is the reuse system that we need to re, re uh, how can I say, like, bring back to our everyday lives, right? Like one of the examples is, you know, uh, Vero here at the Galleria, you have this program called Return to the Earth and Mold It, and it's about teaching how we use the earth to make the bowls and plates and cups out of adobe, out of earth, so when you're finished with it, all you're doing is returning the earth back to the earth. We have those traditional teachings, those knowledge, those, those way of learning how to coexist with our environment, with Mother Earth. It's a matter of deprogramming ourselves to reprogram ourselves Right, deprogram ourselves from what society that we live in today has has brainwashed us to think what is okay and what's appropriate uh, to to relearn the old traditional ways of how we can coexist with our environment and with Mother Earth, so we can ensure that our children have a, a healthy, sustainable future to look forward to. So all these things are intertwined, and you know the petrochemical industry, the fossil fuel industry, you know they, they put out a lot of rhetoric. And it's all intertwined from the extraction, what I call the death cycle, not life cycle, the death cycle of what the fossil fuel and petrochemical industry does, from extraction to transportation, whether it be you know pipelines, you know railroad trucks, whatever it may be, out to the Gulf and out to exports or in the manufacturing of new plastics production. So one of the things that that we recently, I just recently got back from uh, Vietnam at, from a global conference with with representatives from multiple different uh, countries from different communities that are trying to come together to on a global level with the UN to, to push forward a, a plastics treaty uh, globally to get all, all countries to agree to this new transition away, not just reduction, but transitioning out of uh, the use of plastic and, and finding those alternative ways that already exist. And the only way you're going to find it is by, by talking to the communities that are directly impacted 
not by politicians and people or the industry themselves trying to find solutions when they're the, they're the ones that are responsible for the problems that we have and that we're in today. So yes, it's, it's great to hear the different minds and different perspectives. It, it was great learning from so many people from all over the world uh, because again, what works in one community doesn't necessarily work, work in another community. And discussions like this with people like this that you know give their heart and their spirit and know what it is uh, to give of themselves time out of their life. The most precious gift you can give to another human being is time out of your life because you don't get it back. And so that's a gift. And so I just say thank you for that gift and, and sharing to each and every one of you. And I appreciate being here. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Frankie. Um, so next, Camilla, uh, Camilla Factory. Um, her pronouns are she and her. She is the president and executive director of Black Freedom Factory, which is an organization that encourages data-driven activism, redefining professionalism for BIPOC, LGBTQIA+, communities, and youth, and dismantling racial inequity across the state of Texas. She is the Central Texas Regional Organizer for Black Voters Matter, and also a participatory action researcher around police accountability and the school to prison pipeline. And she's also the former, uh, a former participatory action research fellow for Southwest Folklife Alliance and identifies as a queer indigenous Afro-Latina. She's a recurring political commentator for South by Southwest, CNN, MSNBC, ABC uh, News, The Grio, and has been featured in the New York Times as well as the local Texas news media. Um, she's also graduated from TSA, yeah, where she got her BA in political science and led and co-founded there the movement uh, Change Rape Culture, challenging Title IX policies regarding structural violence and sexual misconduct at institutions across San Antonio. And she continues to advocate for reproductive justice as a national speaker for Planned Parenthood. So Camilla, thank you so much. Testing. Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Camille Factory. I, I also want to take a second to just acknowledge the space that I'm sharing with everybody on this stage. A couple years ago, when I decided to advocate for survivors, um, I never would have dreamed. I never would have dreamed. And I think that's the beautiful thing about dreaming. Um, so I work um, now solely what I, I know that my calling is, is abolition, a future without prisons, a future that disregards and accepts incarceration on a mass level, on an international level, where the future is transgender, uh, where the non-binary and fluidity of humanity exists. Um, I. It, it took a lot of, of work uh, to be able to sit here and claim being a queer indigenous Afro-Latina. Uh, my tribe um, is the Wichita affiliated tribes uh, in Anadarko, Oklahoma. Um, and my mom is Puerto Rican, very proud Boricua woman. Uh, but when, when society sees me, they see a black woman. Um, and, and when I interact, with, with youth in San Antonio who are multiracial, who are black, but speak Spanish and have a yearning to reconnect to our ancestors, I think about the anti-blackness within the Latinidad. Um, and I know that my calling is to call out that anti-blackness within the Latinidad and to understand that the lack of access that I have and speaking fluent Spanish is colonization. Um, it's, it's the rape of our land and our people. Um, and I, it even forced me to, to understand the benefits and harms of, of tribal sovereignty um, and how colonizers have literally drawn a line in the sand of where we're sitting uh, and said that this is Texas, when the truth is that the land that we're sitting um, the people of the Yanawana have harvested and nurtured and loved. Um, and so I say all that to say uh, that I was called to action several times in my life, uh, but I founded Black Freedom Factory when George Floyd was murdered in 2020. 
Um, I did not know anything but the pain in my heart and the rage in my soul uh, to march in the city of San Antonio. Um, at the time, I was actually pre-law and I was studying for my LSAT. Uh, and I couldn't focus. Um, all I could feel were the ancestors calling on me. And Black Freedom Factory was born. Um, and I had no idea that through the founding of Black Freedom Factory, I would have to confront not only the anti-blackness throughout the world, but the anti-blackness in San Antonio. Uh, when I, down to when I order in Spanish and I'm corrected in English, uh, or down to when my, the youth uh, in Circles in the Hood, which I'll get to shortly, don't feel like they belong in a, in a space um, of folks who don't identify as black. Uh, and what, is, what does black really entail? What does that mean? Um, so, Circles in the Hood, which I'm here to speak uh, very proudly on behalf of, um, is a youth participatory action research group that myself, Laura, and Amade um, came together to carry on. I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily like the word founding when we're talking about a generational fight and a generational struggle, um, but Circles in the Hood, we literally went to the Casianos and the hoods of San Antonio, Texas, because uh, San Antonio is socioeconomically segregated. They purposely drew the lines to make sure that we have divided access uh, to food, <laughs> to basic resources, to transportation. Um, and so we literally started playing basketball with the youth and started talking about what really affects their neighborhoods. Um, and what that turned into was uh, circle keeping, uh, the circulos and, and the practice and the way of the, of the people who really harvested this land for it to be able to exist is what we now know as San Antonio, Texas. And so um, it was beautiful. Uh, it, it happened quite literally overnight. Uh, we taught and worked with the youth and myself. I learned uh, the ways of the capuli here um, and opening up the directions and every conversation that we have about generational trauma, about how generational trauma looks like what the media likes to call gang violence, uh, what the media likes to call crime. Uh, these are all aspects of generational trauma that are ultimately results of colonization um, and anti-blackness and xenophobia and transphobia and homophobia. Um, in this land that we like to call America, which is stolen. Um, so, so myself, Mari, and Laura work with the youth on imagining a future where, where we plant maize in space, where we say, you know, the future of, of liberation looks like whatever you imagine that to be. Um, and so I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be here, and I feel like I'm lost in my words, um, but I also uh, have the honor of interacting with youth who face the generational trauma of mass incarceration, um, who are the children of undocumented immigrants, right, and who fight for the narrative of their generational future and fruition. Um, in their going to school, in their experiences, in their classroom, being told not to speak Spanish. Uh, even Yaretsi, Yaretsi was like, I wanna hold circles at recess. Um, and she was reprimanded for holding a healing circle at recess with her peers, for wanting to heal her peers, hearing about the traumas that they endure in their classroom. Um, and so Circles in the Hood is the future. Um, it's everything that I, I answer to. Uh, and I realized that the youth are the future. Uh, we, can, we can call ourselves adults, we can position ourselves in research, we can point to the statistics, but the truth is every single time that I talk to one of the youth in circles in the hood, I am corrected. Every single time. I am humbled um, and I am honored to carry on the work of our ancestors uh, who planted several seeds. Uh, so that is the capacity that I sit in today, and I am looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Camille. Um, 
I just think the work that you're doing is incredibly prophetic and profound. When I learned you were 24, I was like, Um, and then we have Maria C. Turvin from um, Yanawana Herbolarios. Um, Maria, whose pronouns are she, is a two-spirit American indigenous woman of Nahua ancestry whose maternal line comes from Guanajuato, Mexico. She was brought up learning the art of energy healing from her mother and cultivated her love and relationship with our plant relatives at the hands of her maternal grandparents. She studied plant medicine for 28 years and is a practicing clinical herbalist who combines traditional indigenous practices with Western clinical herbalism. She's also a teacher, a street medic, a musician, an activist, and the founder and executive operations director of Yanawana Herbolarios. Hello, Nali, everyone. Okay, hmm. Yeah, I'm sitting here listening to all of my colleagues and just, uh, I'm so, so happy um, to be here this evening. So we're supposed to talk about, I guess, uh, <coughs> our work. Um, so um, I guess I'll, I'll uh, say the story of how I, I began my work um, before I get into my work. Um, it's not a story that I uh, tell very often, honestly. Um, so uh, my first medicine actually is um, music. You know, not herbalism. Um, I sang before I spoke, um, uh, way before I was ever actively a, a practicing um, herbalist. I actually would do, uh, you know, healing through my voice, you know. Um, and so that was, you know, the path that I had uh, assumed I was um, on. And uh, I was raised in, you know, um, a mixed, uh, so to speak, culture. Uh, well, I'd say <laughs> culture on one side, lack of culture on the other side. Um, my uh, my paternal line, you know, is um, European descent, German and and English, but um, no no uh, connection to cultural tradition there, right? Because um, my father was raised without cultural tradition um, there. So, uh, but in my mother's side of the family. Um, very immersed in cultural uh, tradition, but as I say, um, separated from context, you know, as many um, indigenous folks in our community are. You know, like I knew growing up um, that I was Nawa, but I also knew it wasn't something that we talked about, right? You know, we just didn't talk about being Indio, you know? And um, so everything, all of the medicines that I were passed down were passed um, without context, right? And um, it's one of the conversations that, that my mom has had and that I feel like some, some older Mexican indigenous folks have had in the community of like, what, I'm not supposed to be proud of being Mexican? It's like, no, 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 I understand, you know, um, Mexican's just a nationality, you know. You're, you're indigenous, and yes, you're Mexican indigenous, but um, you are so traditional, you were raised without your context, and you were raised without your context deliberately um, so that I would be here today, you know, your 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 uh, your ancestors um, took that context when it w became necessary to, um, you know, to preserve our existence, you know, and so um, I find that in doing this work, right, we are um, reclaiming um, the context that was taken from us in cultural genocide, right. Because we are still here, so we can't say genocide, right? Um, but but cultural genocide, right? So we're reclaiming our context and thus reclaiming our power. So um, when I was 18, no, 19, um, I uh, drove across the country with my family. Um, and at that time, I was you know, convinced that like music was, was my path. Um, but we, uh, uh, going through, um, we happened to um, visit Diné territory, you know? And um, I just thought it was probably some of the most beautiful land I had ever seen. Um, and it just made me think so much of, of my um, you know, own heritage. And I thought to myself, you know, if for some reason, some point in my life, you know, I lose this medicine, 
um, I will devote my myself to the other part of my family, medicine, my my herbalism, and I'll actually devote myself to to my community exclusively. Um, you know, so years years later, I got pregnant with my hijita, who's you know sitting over there, and uh, um, I you know knew that I wanted to to raise her um, traditionally, but of course veiled in, in context still at that time. Um, so I did go ahead and start, you know, studying my, my herbalism, just, you know, for her. Um, not at that time, you know, for, for the community. I wasn't thinking, honestly, about that community at that time. I was, I was thinking, you know, specifically, I was 21, thinking specifically of, of, my, of my unborn child. And so um, as, she, as she grew older, the, uh, my plant medicine, you know, my connection with my plant medicine uh, brought me even deeper connecting to, to my heritage. And um, as plants have so much, so much wisdom to share, um, they are themselves, you know, uh, living beings with their own language and songs and innate wisdoms. And um, it uh, made me want so much more, not just for, um, you know, for her future, but for the future of um, all of her, all of her classmates, and of my um, nephew who was getting ready to be born, and of you know um, perhaps grandchildren and, and nieces and nephews I'd have one day, right? And uh, um, so I would, I would always think that you know, as as uh, I would pass down um, these teachings to her, again veiled in context, but teachings to her and to. Uh, um, you know, to two other um, children that, that came into my path, into my world. So um, when Standing Rock happened, during that time I was doing um, operations directing work with a, another organization working in, in Native communities, and not just Native communities, but um, in any community that was vulnerable, right? And uh, um, when Standing Rock happened, uh, the best way I can describe it is I like literally felt um, the drum beat in my heart, and it was as if a, a hook was placed in there, and um, I had no choice but to go. And so <coughs> I told the organization I was with at that time, hey, we're going up to West Virginia. I know South Dakota is not exactly close, but could we, you know, pop on over? And he said, if you raise the money, we can. So um, I raised six thousand dollars in three days, and I said, can we go now? And he said, sure, let's go. And so um, we, we went up and we established uh, the uh, medic healer um, tent in, um, in the Sacred Stone Camp at the um, behest of, of Linda Black Elk and uh, LaDonna. And, uh, um, you know, uh, it was, I've had this experience a few other times, but to live with such purity of intent, such intentionality, such mindfulness with every single person within that community having their role and knowing that um, needs would be met and uh, acting both, you know, individually autonomous, but autonomous as an entire community, you know, and interactive as an entire community and, um, you know, moving with this one beat, you know. And uh, um, uh, just before we went to Standing Rock when I was in West Virginia, I did one last final you know, concert, so to speak. I did not know at the time, really. So while I was at Standing Rock, um, I lost my voice. I, came, I ended up losing my voice because of that. Uh, there was a lot of like chemical overspray. A lot of people um, developed a very severe, severe upper respiratory infection that um, honestly, no herbalists were successful in treating immediately, none of us. And uh, as a consequence, I did lose, you know, pretty much I've, you know, still regaining my voice, but at that time I had a three and a half octave. If you know anything about music, that's impressive if you're a singer. And um, I pretty much like went down to one octave and completely lost my voice. So I was like, oh, so I guess it's time. And uh, um, I pretty much, you know, quit the organization that I was with and I was like, I'm going to go do this work that um, I'm supposed to do. And so um, I didn't have any funding, you know. At that time, I didn't even have a nonprofit structure. I ended up being gifted a nonprofit structure, you know, a few, minu few months later. Um, but I just literally had my herbs and my medic backpack and um, a few friends that I was like, hey, 
you want to go do something? And they were like, yeah, let's go do something. And so um, we, you know, we, we started by, uh, you know, going to the San Antonio Food Bank and for me saying, you know, I have a feeling which side of, you know, town needs the most help, but, you know, which side of town do you, oops, do you see needs most help? And they're like, east side. And I was like, thought so. And um, so we, we, that was where we started out work. We started our work um, on the east side with um, the Ella Austin uh, Community Center, with the seniors specifically. And um, we started out initially, right, just focusing on, um, you know, reconnecting our elders um, to, to the knowledge that they had lost and, and interweaving it with um, these, uh, you know, Western healthcare systems that they were now trapped in, right? And uh, um, then from there, we, um, you know, started working with San, Art, uh, San Anto Cultural Arts with the, with the children, you know, introducing the children to, um, so crazy, to the idea of nature <laughs> and that nature was alive, you know, and that, that, that grass that they would mindlessly pluck out was like, ah, would you want to pluck out your friend's hair, you know? And so um, developing this awareness and um, around that time, we, you know, decided to do a week of clinics and then the community was like, hey, we really like this, um, you bringing us back this traditional medicine, could you give us more of this? So then we started the People's Clinic and um, we still didn't have a, um, a headquarters, so we started doing, you know, uh, partnered up with um, what was uh, the women's, uh, Martinez Women's and now it's in Powerhouse and um, with St. Luke's Baptist and with Cassiano Homes and with Confluence Park and with Eco Centro and with the, um, you know, some community areas out in Floresville because um, that's, that's where I live, you know. And, uh, um, and then the pandemic hit and uh, so then we had to, you know, modify then because everybody shut down and so then we we, we uh, uh, moved to a, a tele um, format and started you know doing clinical work you know oh you know over there and doing little you know mini classes that we'd put out or educational blogs or just really long Facebook posts that we thought would be you know educational and ho helpful and uh, um, and we realized oh hey um, you know, we used to see all of our unhoused relatives uh, at the people's clinic, and uh, now we're doing teleclinics. So then we went ahead and grabbed our, our backpacks, and then the street clinic was born. So then we, you know, started doing um, our street clinic work, you know. And then uh, um, people started pretending that the p pandemic had ended, and uh, we ended up getting a headquarters because, you know, by this time, um, me and, and some of the other people, like, uh, the material stuff from YH was taking over our homes. <laughs> and so we're like, we should get a headquarters. And um, I had already been forming a relationship with you know, with somebody for um, for years, you know, to, to work on just the right property that I knew when the time would come. Because I knew that, um, you know, where I wanted to go next. Because the thing is, is even though I just started these things when it's like, ah, you know, so to speak, when my voice went, um, I had actually been dreaming about these things, you know, since Pat was about mm, eight, nine years old. And I'd always kind of made plans, you know, in my head of how it would go, right? And so I was like, oh, you know, this is, let's do the next step. It's it's the land, but it has to be, it can't just be a place, you know, it has to be the land. Because it's actually not the um, structure that's important. It's the land. Because ultimately, everything that we're doing within our work is tying to is tying to the land, right? And um, so then we we you know we're able to um, get this uh, beautiful five acres of, of woods with creek access on the east side of San Antonio. You know, um, really easy for you to get to any part of town. And we're like, okay, let's you know start working towards. Um, a community outdoor safe space because we we know the pandemic's not over. So um, as we were preparing the space, we continued on with our our street medic work and our, our, our you know pe you know phone clinic work, and um, we you know creating a formula that we distributed thousands of bottles for free to the community to you know help give them the best fighting chance against COVID. And uh, um, and so then we, um, you know, created this this space for the community, 
and opened it back up to the community, bringing them in with our indigenous land management project. So that project is um, pretty much where we are um, rematriating our land, you know, creating food forests, um, you know, clearing out, uh, clearing out um, old uh, plants that have died, you know, from from drought and storm and lack of of loving care, and allowing natives to come back and um, creating a, a healing space for the community to be able to experience. Um, you know, connection to to the land, um, you know, in in a in an outdoor place, uh, in the middle of the city, you know, and um, so we we from there we started that we went to we're like well let's really bring people in so then we started our Feria de Resistencia, so that's our program where we we have the Sewing La Fertura educational program which I'll talk about in a second going on, and sometimes people's clinics going on and, and special events and all this stuff, and um, and that right. And um, so doing all of this work, uh, the last thing I realized um, that I had already known is we needed to, to um, have more folks actively, intentionally doing this work. So then we created the, the Medic Healer Apprenticeship Program. And I have six apprentices that are going down a path of 3,500 hours worth of work that includes um, doing uh, you know, clinical herbalism study and um, doing uh, emergency um, medicine surgery skills and indigenous land management. But the most important thing that they're doing, the thing that ultimately I think is um, most representative of, of all of our work that in goes weaves throughout of all of our work <laughs> is um, a program that we call Burn It All Down, Addressing Systems of Cultural Oppression. And in this work, this is, is where, this class is where they actively work um, to learn how to dismantle these systems. Um, one of the things that I didn't mention is um, we're, in, we're an indigenous um, founded and, and, and run org, um, but we're also a, a queer run org, and we're also a very intersectional run org. We also you know, have um, Philippinex leadership within our organization, black leadership within our organization. Um, and um, the community we serve, you know, while um, largely an indigenous community is very intersectional, you know, it's intersectional at the crossroads of racialized and black and LGBTQ and um, sex workers and unhoused and the working class. Um, because if you look at um, anything that relates to being unhoused or the potential of becoming unhoused, it's very intersectional and, you know, includes um, racial inequity and, you know, um, poor access to, to health care. And um, all, of, all of these things essentially relate back to, um, you know, white supremacy, but even more than white supremacy, you know, um, you know uh, colonialism, but even more than colonialism, um, the patriarchy, right? Uh, if I was to summarize what the intent of, of YH's work is, Yanawana Herbalario's work is, it is to um, release the cultural, or return the cultural knowledge of the land to people, to the community, to reconnect them with their context that they've been stripped of. Because when we do those things, we liberate all people. We don't liberate just one community. And when I say all people, I don't just mean people. I mean that we actually liberate, you know, these plants that are right in front of us, right? We liberate that, that uh, rooster that was on, on the, the roof. You know, we, we, we liberate everybody because we've returned to um, living in agreement with the land. We've turned to the, the, the spirit of reciprocity of um, living relationally with each other. And so, because we are all so far removed from our context, it requires that at the center of our work is that understanding <laughs> of how we got here, but even more importantly, how we ourselves continue to be complicit in our own oppression through the upholding 
of white supremacy within our own lives and our own organizational work through not addressing our own internalized oppressions and realizing that because of, you know, um, colonialization, patriarchy, white supremacy, all this, right? That um, all of these these threads are are woven into our lives, and it's it, and we need to be aware of it, and we need to pull it out, and we need to um, not berate ourselves for our participation, but become aware of our participation, so that we can um, see where that comes from and address our behavior, and gently call our community in um, when they um, do that behavior, and and in a in a way that's like, hey, I see that you have a wound that hasn't healed. It's manifesting in the upholding um, of white supremacy, you know. Um, maybe not that way, because they might be like, whoa, but you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> in that like, hey, you know, um, we, we want to go forward doing, doing this, this work. And so everything that we do within our organization is we like to say that we're just helping people remember um, that um, those within the organization doing this work that we're blessed enough to um, have had different privileges in our life that um, made sure that this knowledge was was in our hands, and that it's our responsibility to, um, you know, help our community remember the knowledge that actually exists innately within them, you know. And uh, so everything from our educational work, our clinical work, because even in our clinical work, it's like, hey, you're still in charge. I'm just guiding you. You're making decisions for yourself. I'm just giving you information and I'm gonna teach you how to do this stuff for yourself. So um, for us, it's, it's all about learning how to um, work together as that community and to, um, to really, to, as, as our, one of our head, our head mixture says, to make sure that we are decolonizing and not returning to, to pre-colonial methods because if we are, are trying to, um, you know, literally create rematriated societies, then we need to make sure that they're rematriated societies um, that are uh, equitable for, for all, for, for those that are disabled, for, the, for transgender, for black, for racialized, for children, for elders, you know, for, um, for the land, for, for everybody. Thank you so much, Maria. And um, I could tell, yes, sorry. So yes, we're gonna uh, we're gonna hear from Arturo, and then we'll take a, a, a few minutes break. There's food, um, and uh, and we'll regroup we'll regroup down here together in a, in a circle. Um, but thank you so much for your work, um, Arturo. If you want to maybe just respond to what's been shared here with your own work, right, and, and ideas as they resonate, as they um, you know, points of connection, points of divergence. But yeah, thank you so much for being here. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to start by thanking Marisol and Greg, Maria, Kimilla, Diana, Frankie, uh, Carla, uh, Veronica, his familia, and the wonderful Galeria, and the wonderful space, community space here. And of course, this amazing evening, and our land, and the ancestors, and ancestors. In Spanish, you say las ancestras y los ancestros. The feminine ancestors and the male ancestors as well uh, of this land get the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much for sharing your stories with us, with me. Uh, I've learned so much about them already, and I would like to make some comments of what I heard. To some extent, the context of the work that I've done in Colombia with many people, but also of the world that is going on in different parts of the earth right now, because it's a global struggle and global processes, and there is so much connections among these struggles, even if we don't see them and don't make them explicitly, but they are happening. Okay, and I want to start by maybe saying a little bit about me. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Okay. Uh, I was born and grew up in Colombia. I was born in a part of Colombia uh, that 
a city called Manizales. Uh, some of you might know Colombia is part of the same, talking about culture. Colombia is a country of many different cultural groups in many ways, and ethnic groups as well. It's a part of Colombia where there is more uh, white people, but uh, my parents were poor peasants, especially my father was a, came from a very poor peasant family, a very large family, <coughs> who moved to the city to get a job, uh, manual work, uh, my mother as well, basically to, because the dream, like the dreams of so many immigrants here in the US is to make their children better than they were. But there was also the dream of the years of so-called development for Latin America, when Latin America, Asia, and Africa were, be began to be described as underdeveloped, as third world. Some of you might remember said the category of third world that was invented for these poor countries. And then that the, that the uh, solution to the underdevelopment was going to be to develop, and to develop especially through capital and technology and the adoption of the values of, of modernity and competition and innovation and all these different things. And the model was, of course, the US. So it was like become, become like the US. So from the time I was very young, I reacted and resisted this so-called dream that was very pervasive in Latin America at, the, at that point, the same in Asia, in Asia and in Africa, and began to connect with movements in the larger region. And for the past three years in particular, I've been working mostly with black movements in Colombia, or with the same group of, group of people in Colombia, some indigenous movements as well, women's movements and environmental movements. And we are engaged in what we call a transition project for our region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that after my comments and your presentations. If we get a chance, I don't want to take too long. Otherwise, I will talk a little bit about, it, about that in the conversation as well. Okay, so how to start? I mean, I have a web of connections here among the things that you were talking about. And I will start with something that Marisol mentioned in her remarks. She said, el agua es vida, el agua es vida, what is life? And there are so many circles around water today. I mean, uh, you frankly refer to those as well. Um, and La Was Vida reminded me of the, uh, the, the slogan, sort of the principle of a struggle that was led by a genuinely black, grassroots black feminist environmentalist from Colombia, who is now the vice president of the country whose name is Francia Marquez. I don't know if any of you have heard about Francia Marquez. A really, really wonderful woman organizer who at that point in time, that this was in 2014, led a march from her community close to the city of Cali, where I grew up and where I live half of the year, all the way up to Bogota, 500 kilometers, in defense of the territory against gold mining. And the lemma, the slogan of the, of the movement was, el territorio es la vida y la vida no se vende, se ama y se defiende. Territory, the territory is life, and life is not sold, it is loved and defended. So the territory, the space for living a different kind of life, for living in life in community, living life in, com in, in, com in, uh, in a tune, a tune to the earth. So that connected me to the second thing that you said, my soul, that we need to decolonize our relation to the earth. We usually talk about decolonization in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of you know, white supremacy, but we're beginning to be more conscious about how decolonization, decolonizing our relation to the earth is so crucial and so important. And I think um, return to the natural law of life, right, say. And that reminded me of what is it that we need to decolonize in the last instance? We need to decolonize, decolonize the human. And the human, I arrived there through the work of a wonderful Jamaican writer whose name is Sylvia Winter. She's very difficult to, play, to read. She writes in a very abstract way. But one of the main points that she makes that she really is, I think is really powerful, is that today, worldwide, to a greater or lesser extent, we're all trapped within a particular view of the human. 
the human, the view of the human that arose and developed in the West, that she characterizes as the human as a view of the human as secular, separated from the sacred, uh, liberal, that believes in the individual, separated from community, and the humans separated from nature and superior to nature and in need to dominate nature. Western and bourgeois is a class view of life. It's a, it's, a, it's a human that believes in private property. It's a human that is competitive, aggressive, uh, dominating of nature, and all these different things. And if we, pay, if we, if we really uh, listen to what she's saying, we have to realize that, yes, we're all, I mean, I think we're, we're all connected to these networks of this created by this kind of human, this vision of the human. And hence that we have to liberate the human as well to deprogram ourselves. I think Frankie also mentioned that. From that kind of humanity, view of the human, to reconnect with a different view of the human, that is what? What is it? And, and, and there are ideas that are coming around from all different kinds of movements that are connected to place, that are attuned to the earth, that are more relational, that acknowledge the interdependence of everything that exists. And this is the wonderful Southern African principle of Ubuntu. If you haven't come across Ubuntu, you should look it up. Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. Ubuntu, which is a principle of I am because you are. I exist because everything else exists. So the principle of radical interdependence is now the basis, because it's the real foundation of life. Life, not as we have learned from that human from the West, from the modern West, the dominant human. Life is not based on separation between humans and non-humans, anthropocentrism, or between the sacred and the secular. Life is sacred all around, all throughout. So that's, that's um, the connection to decolonization of the earth. The question of how do we live now? How do we live now then? Is the question that we're all confronted. The question how do we live against terricide, against the killing of the earth? And the concept of terricide comes from a, a wonderful indigenous intellectual from South America, from the Walmapu, which is the Mapuche territory in the southern part of South America, which is Argentina and Chile. When she says, she coined, they, they coined this term called terricide, meaning by that, the killing of the earth, but not only the killing of the physical ecosystems, but also the killing of the spiritual ecosystems, the knowledge ecosystems, on which the survival and the life of indigenous peoples, but also every human being depends on the earth, on that knowledge and spiritual ecosystem. So we have to keep that into attention. We're working in a way against terrorism. We're working for a different kind of human, We're working towards a different kind of building community. And then I'll talk a little bit about the economic aspect of that as well. So it is a different way of seeing life. Some people call it a different narrative of life. The life that acknowledges the communal, the place, dimension, uh, the interdependence, the fact that that we need to care for the way of life in what, out of which we all all life comes, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. And so, if we are trapped in this story of separation, this story of the human as dominating the earth, as individual, as aggressive, as competitive. And that's the way to succeed in globalization and in global markets. But we need to succeed in communities. We don't need to succeed. We don't want to be successful in globalization, in global capitalist terms. So how do we do? And one of the words that have come across in a very strong way in the last decade or two decades is transition. So we need to transition. And some of you say that. And the first thing that we're thinking about transitions is that transitions are always already happening. In all of these resistance movements, in all of the things that you have shared, in all of the movements that people all over the world are engaging with, uh, transformative alternatives that to a greater or lesser degree are small or large or whatever size, they tend to be smaller, but tend to be radical and transformative. They, trend, they tend to go against hierarchies. They, they tend to be anti-patriarchal, anti-racist, decolonizing the relationships uh, uh, between peoples and with the earth, that in all of those al al alternatives that are happening today in many different parts of the world, the transitions are already happening. 
uh, we can think about organizing beautiful transitions, and, and we do, and we will. And I think the connection that we're making here is part of that weaving of alternatives, weaving networks of networks of alternatives. And one of the key processes that have been, we have been noticing worldwide is the increased realization of the need to create convergences and convergence spaces among or across networks of alternatives, or networks of networks, networks of alternatives. And we've been looking at how these are sprouting in different parts of the world, and there are several already global networks of networks of alternatives. So we don't see them. Why don't we see them? Because they are not broadca broadcasting in the news. They don't make it to the news because the news, the news, the six o'clock news, only report on the state of the toxic systems with, with which we live. And, and it, it is mirage. I mean, it's, 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 it, it, sort of the news continuously, day in and day out, cheat on us by not telling us that there is other ways of being and doing and healing that are emerging worldwide um, that they should be also reporting on. And the alternative media to some extent do, but we need better media strategies also to make them known and to help them thrive. Uh, so that's the part about how do we organize for transitions. And there will be much more to say about that, but I, as I said, I don't want to take too long, and I already took longer than I wanted, and I'm just beginning, but I'm going to say just a couple of things about each of the presentations to end, in addition to this. Uh, growing up with airplanes and with military bases reminded me that the process that is ongoing, and you know this much better than me, is the process of occupation. The occupation from the conquest of America on in this part of the world. The process has been the occupation of territories, people's territories, but also people's life and experiences and minds is what in philosophy we can call an ontological occupation. It's a way of being that occupies other ways of being and tries to suppress those ways of being. That's coloniality. And decoloniality is how do we try to emancipate ourselves from that ontological occupation, a worldview that occupies other worldviews, and that deem those other worldviews inferior or untenable or non-credible alternatives to what exists, or second-hand, or detrimental, or primitive, or what have you. So what has been going on is occupation in the largest sense of the term, that includes the occupations of communities and local economies, but includes an occupation that is much more pervasive and deeper. And that's why decolonizing movements today engage with that deep level of, of dealing with that occupation. Uh, the centrality of energy as well, fracking, extraction, the centrality of extraction. That extraction is the model of development of the global age. Is extract mineral resources, whatever you can, the Americans are doing it, the Chinese are doing it, the Europeans are doing it, uh, the larger countries from the global south, Brazil does it in Latin America, South Africa does it in other parts of Africa. It's a global logic of extraction because extraction is the key to global capitalism, to, to global corporations maintaining the, rates of, the huge obscene rates of profit, to create the obscene levels of inequality that, that they have created over the past 50 years. So that the last 70 years of so-called development and globalization have coincided with the, large, the increase and exponential increase in inequality worldwide and within countries, including the US, and the amazing increase in the spoliation, destruction, devastation, and destruction of the earth, and sort of pillage of the earth. So those two things. So an energy central to that. And they are now selling us from the north the energy transition, corporate transition, energy transition, not a just transition. We need to differentiate those two transitions. A corporate transition, a decarbonization of the north at the expense of the global south, at the expense of the territories, the indigenous territories, the Chicano territories, the African American territories, the territories in Africa, Asia, and Latin America where the strategic minerals are going to be extracted, when the great plantations of, of oil palm for biofuels are, go, are, are being planted now 
hundreds of thousands of hectares, people being displaced all over the place. Uh, lithium, molybdenum, coltan, all the strategic minerals are being extracted from the global south, supposedly to feed and support the decarbonization of the global north. So the false solutions that some of you mentioned, like the green economy, green markets, carbon trading, are false solutions. They are not real transition, energy transitions, but we need to pursue these ideas about a just transition that is just also for the global south. Okay. Uh, there are a few threats that for me are super important that some of them came up here, but I see very clearly many parts of the world. The defense of water is one, the threat of water, food struggles for food so sovereignty, for the sovereignty of, of food production. How do we remake, reclaim our ability to grow our food, our ability to make our lives? Because we have given up our ability to make life. We have given it to corporations and the state and experts and supermarkets and all these different things. We don't know how to make life mo anymore, mo most of us. So here we have the chickens and we have the herbs and we have communities that are thriving, re regaining the ability to make life. And that's super important today. So that's, so um, the threat of water, the threat of food sovereignty, obviously the, the, the threat of environmental justice, gender justice, race justice, global justice movements. It's also very important across all of these transition movements. Um, the, um, the, the envisioning, the visioning and dreaming of how futures could be otherwise and how we can create those futures today is so hugely important today as well. And I was reminded of abolitionism, which is one of the most radical visions of a life beyond the current life that is destroying life. And I was reminded me of, many of you probably know, the Combahee River Collective Statement Manifesto, which is a beautiful manifesto of a, a collective, a black women's collective in the 1980s, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, uh, and, and, and the, the, if I recall correctly, the manifesto say that the peoples of the world will be liberated only when black women get to be liberated, because black women are the most oppressed peoples. And in a similar way, a, we will have a liberated world, a different world, a human world, in a different sense of the human, only when prisons are abolished because only prisons will be abolished when we are able to create, to remake the world, to redesign the world in a very radical way, in a way in which makes prisons and, and uh, um, a thing of the past, in a way in which racism is a thing of the past, exploitation is a thing of the past, all of the isms that create the possibilities for crime to be, to emerge, as the crime that is a crime punish, punishable by those in power and recognized as crime by those in power, then when that disappears, when those conditions disappear, then there will be true liberation. So that's the radicalness uh, for me of abolitionism as well, which is, a, which is a, also a beautiful view of interdependence, that we are all interdependent, that we cannot be feel free and liberated until everybody is free and liberated. And finally, I really spoke for a long time, no? No. Uh, you see? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, finally, care and healing. That also came strongly. And the care and the healing of the web of life. The care uh, transition in many ways is the set of, a st is the practice, is the set of a strategies to bring about uh, the healing and reconstitution of the web of interrelations that constitute the bodies and landscapes and territories and communities that we are and that we inhabit. So in, in this new um, approaches in design studies, which is a very different view of design from the conventional one, completely different, that I will be talking about um, tomorrow. We define that kind of design, which is a relational design from interdependence, precisely as a praxis or a practice 
for the healing and reconstitution of the way of life. And that's what we all have to do. That's what you all are doing in a wonderful way. That's what we've been trying to do in Colombia in our project, transition project in Colombia. And uh, the aim, obviously, is to mobilize larger groups of people and communities for, a new, for new ways of dwelling on the earth. Because after all, it's about dwelling in a different way, in a way that is earthwise, and in which humans and the earth can finally coexist in a mutually enhancing way. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Escobar, and thank you to everybody that spoke. I'm just like crying the whole time. <laughs> so thank you very much for all your work. Um, so at this time, um, thank you so much. Rosalia, Rosalia uh, brought food, um, so we have food at the back. Maybe we can take a little break, grab some food, get, uh, grab some aguas frescas, and then um, we're kind of like at the time where we thought we would end, but uh, but maybe we those who need so those who need to leave, you know, don't feel like you can't. But if if you want to stay, we can circle up and and just more continue the discussion more um, kind of free form. But yeah, please.